people here are uh, uh, not accomplished, our end.
uh, you need to be a mentor for other people as well. That is the single most important thing in Christian life. So one thing to think about is, do you have somebody like that in your life? Or are you very close? Very guarded? I don't want anyone to speak my mind. I don't want to tell me what to do. You could just be on your own. But you're in trouble. When I was a sophomore in college, Pastor Bruce came and fished me out of the sea of confusion at NYU and said, I'm going to disciple you, boy. And I said, all right, what's this all about? Let's do it. And uh, he started discipling me. And I really thank God for him. He really uh, set me straight in a lot of ways. He developed me, he taught me, he matured me. Uh, you know, he let me preach in the college ministry when I was a senior. Now I look back, I'm like, what the heck are we doing? You know? I know what I was doing. He gave me an opportunity to preach. He really developed my leadership. He also corrected me and rebuked me when I was a fool, when I was acting a fool. God was really uh, arrogant and proud in all of this. I just kind of like, I don't know, I just thought I was smart or something. I don't know why. I mean, what the heck am I doing? I'm like, I'm hard for you. I thought I was smart. I thought I was really like, you know, sharp. And so sometimes I would get kind of argumentative at our college leadership meetings. I would kind of insist on certain ways because I thought it was right. I think one day I just I just really got off past the Bruce's nerves and I just really kind of pushed him the wrong way. And then he, in the middle of this meeting, everybody, he looked at me and he said, Boy! What do you know about the industry? And they were like, ooh. <laughs> I was just like quiet. I was like quiet. He goes, Boy, you don't know shit! Did you hear him today again? Learning 
how to disciple, how to open myself up, how to love other people. I'm still not a naturally gifted disciple, right? I think, you know, my strengths and the way God has made me lies more out of areas. But we all have to learn how to do it. We all have to learn how to disciple. Discipling is not for just like, well, you know, that person is a small group leader, so that person disciples with me. I'm a, I'm a worship team member, so that's my ministry, right? The worship doesn't work like it. Everybody needs the disciple. Some people, let me put it this way, some people are going to major in discipling, but everybody's got a minor. Everybody's got a minor. Great commission, go make disciples of all nations, is for everybody. I'm sure, you know, you know Billy Graham. What is he? He's an evangelist. He's not a discipler. He's an evangelist. He reaches the unsaved people. He brings them to the kingdom. That's what he does. That's what God gave him to do. But I'm sure Billy Graham also has meetings, many people, a group of young, budding evangelists that he meets with. And then he disciples. He teaches them. This is the life of evangelists. These are the pitfalls of an evangelist. This is what you have to watch out for. This is what you do when you do an evangelistic rally. This is the character of an evangelist. He works with them. He teaches them. He listens to their messages. I'm sure he mentors people. So in that way, he is also a disciple. He has a niche group, a specific group that he's disciple. But he's still doing it. His major is evangelism. His minor is disciple. Right? It's something we all have to do. Some of you will be fantastic at it, and you will become like a small group leader of small group leaders. You know? You're like, you're teaching not just leading a small group, you're teaching other people how to do a small group. You're teaching other people how to decide. Uh, some of you may have gifts in other areas. You may have a group of two or three people who you're influencing, maybe in a specific way. But still, you're deciding to be an influence. Discipleship is forever. Alright. Let's look at just a few things, a few basics of what uh, is a part of this Okay, let's just look at a few things. Okay, what are the four components of this action? Um, four things that are involved in this island. Okay, here's one. Bible knowledge. When you're disciple people, you have to teach them the Bible. You can't just get together and hang out. Uh, you can't just pray for one another. Uh, you can't just uh, give advice about dating or marriage. You also have to teach the Bible. Now, you know, for most of you guys in, in AMI churches, you probably have like a first small group leader or something like that. You have a Bible study they give you to kind of go over with people or Maybe do a Dr. Bible studies or something like that. So that's cool, you're doing that. But Bible knowledge has to be something that is a part of what we teach. Right? You have to teach people about the Trinity. You have to teach people about the assurance of salvation. If you um, you know, if you don't teach people about spiritual gifts, they may never know that these things are things that we should pursue. Things for the church. These are things you have to teach. If you don't teach people the Bible, you're going to have a passionate, God loving <laughs> disciple who one day starts a cult. Four members of the Trinity or something like that. Why? Because you never told them they were They screwed up. They end up uh, being swayed by a cult, this or that. Bible knowledge is important. So, do you yourself know the Bible? Are you able to teach the Bible? Very important. Don't overlook this. Second, heart. What do I mean by heart? What I mean by heart is, what is this person really passionate about? Not only do you need to teach them Bible knowledge, but you also need to uh, you also need to mold and deal with the person's passions, the person's worldviews, the ways uh, they see the world, what he or she 
is living for, their modus operandi, what they're going for in life. They could be a Christian, but they could have a worldview or passion that is very different from the one that God wants us to have. I was a Christian since uh, junior year of high school, but for the first several years of my life as a Christian in the college, my goal was to be rich. I saw no problem with that. I wanted to be a rich Christian. Uh, I said, missions, that's fantastic. Let me be the one to financially support it. There's nothing wrong with that. But deep in my heart, there was an ulterior motive of the love of money. That was very much a part of ruling my world and part of my passion. So I went to business that was school for underground, very fast about internships, very, very simple things. And that was something that had to be changed and molded in me so that God would be my passion. What is this person's worldview? What is this person with passion? Um, you know, uh, I've met people before who, uh, growing up, you know, they've been told, you're not going to amount to anything. People have been told that by their parents. You're not going to amount to anything. So they grow up with this massive chip on their shoulder where they have to prove themselves. Everything is about proving themselves. So they work hard in school, they work hard in internships, they work hard in getting a job. Why? Because the goal is, I'm going to amount to something. I'll show you, Mom, Dad, I'm going to amount to somebody. And it filters into their ministry, too. Their ministry has to be about proving something. Whatever ministry they're involved in. And without knowing it, there are all these things, these passions, these other worldviews that are existing in there alongside being Christian. And it can be scary. I was in uh, 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 Central America a bunch of years back. And we were in this village. And we saw this church. Nice looking Christian church. Then we found out that what many of these indigenous people did back then when the um, you know the Spanish came or the Portuguese came and they brought in Christianity because many times they were forced into kind of these beliefs, they would build these churches, but as a way of preserving their spiritual uh, animism, as they were building the church in the foundation, along the sides of the foundation, they would carve into it their animistic symbols and numbers. And I saw this church. Christian church, and the side had eroded the dirt or whatever, and I saw these faces and animals and things like that in the base of the church. I got freaked out. I was like, that's, that's scary. That's really scary. And, uh, you know, that's how we are. We have this Christian exterior, but we have different passions, different goals, other things that are really driving us. And one goal of discipleship is to really be able to reveal what is making somebody tick and to help that person see that and to conform that instead into a godly passion and not a worldly passion. Sometimes it's like just worldly advice or worldly wisdom that filters it. I have this one guy in my small group. I don't know if you guys ever encountered guys like this. But I have this one guy in my small group like 10 years ago who would always like, you know, we'd be talking about the Bible, we'd be sharing or something, using Bible verses. This guy would always use something out of like a self-help book. Like a like a some type of like a maxim he would say. And he'd be sharing, we'd all be talking, and then he would say something like, well, you know, I think this or that, because you know, God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> you know, I'll be like, what? That, that's not the Bible. Where do you get that? And then you say things like, you know, yeah, and I really have to, you know, work hard and I have to try to move up my company, you know, because you know how it is, you know? You know, you gotta get yours. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was no, it was wrong, you gotta get yours. And, and he, I was like, what are you talking? He was saying this, you believe this? I'm like, do you hear what you're saying? But he operated in all these things, 
like, oh, what section of Barnes Noble he was hanging out in, what he was reading, but like there are all these things that filtered in that affected his understanding of the world and, and, and how to live that has seeped into his Christianity. So part of discipleship is really being able to understand and, and mold and help somebody's passions become biblical, godly passions. There is this great bird in uh, great verse in Proverbs. So great I don't remember where it is, but it's really great. And I always quote it myself and other people. And it goes like this. It says, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters. Meaning, what's really inside of you, your purposes, the things that drive you, are deep like Titanic, some deep, bottom of the ocean, deep. That's what you really are down in there. And then it says, but a man of understanding draws them out. So it's like a discipler. If you disciple people with understanding, it's like deep sea fishing. You're like casting and letting that, that, that lure and that hope go down. You're trying to catch on to these things that are deep down on the seabed and bring those things up to the surface to reveal what's really in the heart. So I had a chance to talk to this guy who was told, you know, you're not going to mount anything. You know, so gently and lovingly I would talk and, and try to show him, like, hey, you know, could it be that what your parents said to you, what you went through, that's really part of the reason why you're so ambitious, you're so driven, you're devoting so much time to these things. And, and then he was like, yeah, I think, I think that may be it. That may be what's really in my heart. And that's the kind of discipleship we want to do, right? We don't want to just, we don't want to just deal with um, outward performance orientation. We want to deal with changing the deep things of the heart. So discipleship means being a man or woman of understanding and drawing out the deep purposes that are within the heart. Third, uh, character. Third thing that you need to do if you're discipling someone or people is you need to work on their character. And character and their, their passions, what I talked about um, earlier, the heart, uh, there can be a lot of overlap. But the way that I'm using character is specifically, I'm talking about more things like um, relationships, uh, morality, habits, these types of things. You know, uh, are, are you an honest person? Or do you tend to lie? You tend to stretch the truth, you know. You know, like those guys, you know, like, oh, hey, you know, how come you were, how come you were late today? Oh, uh, you know, uh, traffic, train delay. Oh, really? Oh, okay. We're like, you know, 30 minutes late. Later on, I find out that like, train delay was like five minutes. Well, hardly even a delay. Like, I slow down. I slow down a little bit. 25 minutes was because he just threw me out of bed, or this or that. And then, you know, like, I, I bet you he's, like, sitting on a train, like, begging for a delay. Oh, even one minute! So I can say there was a train delay. Was there a train delay? Yeah, there was a train delay. Is that the truth? No. It's the technical truth, but it's deception. It's character. It's a character issue. Sometimes, like, I was talking about earlier today. Guys don't know how to act around girls. Too flirty, you know, inappropriate, things like that. Character issues. Don't know how to talk to people. Easily losing their temper. Don't know how to work together with other people. Selfish. A lot of things that are part of your character. Those are things you also need to work on when you're discipling people. Because who you are when no one is looking. That is really who you are, right? That is one of the best definitions of character that I've heard. Character is who you are when no one's And if I were honest with you, 
Uh, I would say that the person that you see standing up here right now, me, is not always exactly the same as the person that's by himself when you when I'm alone, when you don't see me. There are things that are different. There are ways in which I lack integrity in my life. And I can be a hypocrite. But my goal is that I would be able to bring my public life and my private life into alignment so that I have integrity. That's the best goal. Somebody once asked Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, they were saying, oh, your dad is this amazing man, this amazing evangelist that God has used in so many ways. Can you, can you tell me, what, what is he like at home? What is the home life, the private life of this amazing man, Billy Graham? What is he like? And then Franklin Graham said, he's exactly the same as he is at home. The way he is at home, he's exactly the same the way he is. That's character. That's character. Character is important. Why? Because ministry flows out of being. If you don't have character, you can fake ministry. You can fake it for a while. But you're not going to produce fruit in ministry and disciple. It's just not going to happen. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. There is a spiritual principle there. If you think that you can disciple other people, and you can talk to them about their character, you can tell them you need to pray, you need to read the Bible, you need to be honest, but then you yourself don't do those things. It's not going to last. It's not going to have a lasting impact. You're not going to influence people. Because you cannot reap what you have not sown. God can't be mocked. If you could, that would mean you could mock God. <laughs> God, I've been faking it for 20 years. Yeah, look at my amazing ministry. And people whose lives have been genuinely changed. Do you think that's possible? It's not possible. God can't be mocked. Character counts. Fourth, ministry know-how. What I mean is, you also, not only do you need to teach people the Bible, not only do you have to deal with their heart and their character, but you also have to teach them how to do ministry. Um, Somebody can be very passionate for God, can love God, can be open with you in a discipleship relationship, can attend church faithfully, all these things. But that doesn't mean they know how to do ministry. Uh, I went out evangelizing and sharing the gospel with some people one day. And we were taking turns sharing with people. We were like, we're in the park in, uh, in New York, Washington Square Park. And so we were sharing the gospel, we took turns. And then this guy goes, you know, he shares the gospel. Afterwards, you know, we're talking about it. And uh, I had to tell him, I said, oh, you know, it was good. And, you know, this, this encouraged us. One thing I would work on, you know, you, you forgot to mention sin. You're sharing the gospel with this person. And the guy was like, oh, yeah, sin. That's right. That's right. Why we need the cross? We forgot to tell God that He's a sinner, that we, we need to be forgiven. Basic things. But people need to be trained. They need to be taught. Um, as you take them out of the ministry, as you show them, uh, this is how you pray for somebody. You know? It doesn't matter if if you get this sense that, you know, you know, he's supposed to marry her. Don't say it right now. Don't say it. You tell me later, okay? Don't say that, you know? Just, just say, I think God has a wonderful woman for you in your life, right? You know? Things like that, it, it, these are things that need to be trained, need to be taught. Um, you need to show somebody how to do ministry. 
You know, you need people to come and ask you, oh, you know, uh, I was talking to this person who's who's really, you know, has suicidal thoughts, really wants to take their own life. I don't know what to do. What do I do? You counsel them. You teach them how to be a counselor. You have to give people ministry know-how as well. So you have to ask yourself, are you equipping people to do ministry too? Are you equipping them to also do ministry? Those are four things, um, practical things, elements. So as you, you know, if you're a small group leader, if you counsel people, if you're just flat out just helping even just one other person grow in their faith, right? Are those four elements there? All of them are important. If you take any one away, you can get really screwed up. You can get really screwed up, right? Okay? Okay. All right, let's talk about a few foundations of discipleship. What I mean is, uh, you know, components are kind of things that are practical. How do you, what are you supposed to teach a person when you're discipling them? Three foundations of discipleship are things that our discipleship should rest upon, kind of more philosophical considerations. And uh, the first is uh, modeling. Now, not talking about Zoolander modeling, I'm talking about uh, example, showing people, modeling. Uh, discipleship, if you want to look at more of uh, a biblical model of discipleship, it really was about doing life together, modeling Christ, showing Christ to your disciple. Jesus and his disciples lived together for three and a half years. Every, they walked together, they talked together. Jesus, when he was teaching, they were with him. When they slept, they were in the same place. They did everything. They ate together. Jesus modeled Christian life to them. The best Old Testament examples of discipleship are Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha. Remember that, right? Elisha was a tense dude. Those are the best Old Testament examples. Best New Testament examples are Jesus and his disciples, and I will also say Paul with Timothy and Titus. If you look at all of these relationships, they were close. These people spent a lot of time together. They were together all the time. So as they were together, the discipler, the mentor, was able to model Christian life, godly life, to the disciple. If you think that you're really going to effectively disciple somebody by meeting up in a Bible study once a week, you're kidding yourself. That is not enough. And I'm sure in all of your churches, in, in, in whether you're in college or working, they tell you, hey, you know, you also got to call people up. Right, Doug? The Barry said, the Barry said, they got to call people up, right? Meet up with them. You're working them. Treat them to dinner. Buy them dinner. Play basketball together. Play frisbee together. Hang out, right? That's what he said. I'm sure that's what he said. If not, don't disagree with me. <laughs> you know, in AMI, we, we, all, we always say, you know, it, why do we say all those things? Because it's about life together, time together, modeling Christian life. Not just talking about it, but showing it. Christian life is like show and tell. Let me show you Christian life. And I'm sure many of you, you have certain people in your life who've influenced you in terms of your faith. And what you remember probably wasn't, well, he was really good at explaining the Trinity to me. You know, oh, she was, she was so good at teaching on the book of Philippians. What you probably remember was somebody who was honest, somebody who really, really loved you and was always available to talk. Somebody would call you up just to say how you were doing and was there to listen to you. Even at times if you feel like your parents didn't listen to you, when no one was listening to you, this person was listening to you. There was somebody who just looked at their life and you said, wow, I want to be like this person. This person is such a servant. This person is so committed to praying and working hard and I just see an example of Christian living from this person. That probably has impacted you more than the Bible study times. 
because they model Christian life to you. And that is very biblical. The biblical model is more like, like, a, like a Yoda and Skywalker, right? Old dude, young guy, discipling, like together, let me show you life, or life let me show you, whatever, right? That was what it is. It's Miyagi and Danielson in the Karate Kids, right? You can find these all over. What are, why, why do we love watching movies like that? Why do we, how many movies you see where it's like the, the, the mentor or the guru figure, you know, it's like, well, let's sit around together and let's look at this book. Oh, it was not really like that. It's like, let me show you, right? There's a reason for that. That comes from somewhere. Because that's a very biblical model. Time together. So what's the application? Move out of your place. Move in with your smaller members. <laughs> Make one mass. I heard about this uh, homeless house. She's the same with people, like 10 people in a one-bedroom apartment. Or something like that. I don't know if they're almost like a small group or something. But, you know, if they are, that would be the epitome, ultimate example of what I'm talking about today. Living together, doing life together. I think, you know, I think that would be great. You know why? Because when you live together, you see everything about each other. You can only hide it for so long. You know, sometimes like, you know, you, you know when you're not living together, you know, you feel like, I gotta go. Why do you have to go? I gotta go. Why? Because I'm about to sin if I stay here any longer. I'm so mad. I'm gonna run, right? You can't do that. You live together. Where are you gonna sleep at night? No. You see everything. Which is why right now I love mission training with my, my college students at Remnant. I can't wait till we go out on the mission field. We have to sit next to each other on that toilet. <laughs> and just be out there. I can't wait to see people get mad, snap at each other, and say, that's my water. No, that's my water. I can't wait to see that. Because then I'll go, ah That's who you really are. That's who you really are. You couldn't hide anymore. You hide for only so long. But once the night comes, that carries your back of the pocket. I see who you really are. She's still this beautiful, young, nothing changes on the outside. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's, that's the type of discipleship that will really, really change lives. Um, and, you know, that, you know, I know right now, especially if you're in college, you know, there are certain things we do specifically because of college, right? You know, whether it's family group or small group or life group or just group or whatever you call it. There's certain structures in place, um, you know, however, whatever structure you're working in in your church, there are principles here that you can apply within that structure. Discipleship is a life-on-life -life thing. It is a modeling thing. It's not so much about information. It's more about impartation, okay? I said it before, you need to get Bible knowledge. But you, if you just get a Bible knowledge, you can turn somebody into a Pharisee. It's not just about information. It is about impartation. Then receiving of me, Christian influence, Christian life, me imparting to them the spirit of God. It's not just about information. Jesus appointed 12. Why? That they might be with him. Okay? Together. Living together. Discipleship. What is discipleship about when you're modeling? When you're modeling, your disciples should do what you do. Ultimately, right? Like I said, show and tell. They're doing what you do. What, what are the signs of the kingdom? In the gospel, there are three things that inaugurated the coming of the kingdom. They were the proclamation of the gospel, the kerygma, the casting out of demons, and the healing of the sick. Those three things were a statement by Christ that the kingdom has come. After a while, what did he tell his disciples to do? He told them to go out and preach, cast out demons, and heal. He told them to do the same things that he did. That's what discipleship is. You can't just always talk about evangelism. 
You got to say, let's go out today to the park and let's go evangelize together. Let me show you. Let's see what we can learn together. It's not about just saying, go to, go. you need to pray more in your life. No, I'm going to prayer meeting now. You're coming with me. Let's go pray. Let's go pray together. I know you don't want to go, but you'll be blessed when you're there. Because Pastor Jim just, just knows how to groove. It's like prayer meeting is Pastor Jim's natural habitat, right? Bring down Christians to prayer meeting. They'll get saved. Right? It's all about the way that he leads to prayer meeting. Bring them. You go. You bring your disciple. And they grow in prayer. You say, oh, let's fast together. I hate fasting, but for the sake of your growth, let's fast together. You show them how to do it. You do that together. In your smaller meetings, you pray for each other. You listen for the voice of God. You show them these things. You seek it. You model it. I was skipping that through that one. Uh, Acts 4, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The years, three and a half years of being together paid off. People saw the effect. Jesus rubbed off on them. You know, I don't know if people would say this. But I hope they would. I would take it as such a compliment if they said, you know, Ulysses, when I look at you, I really, you remind me of Pastor Victor. You're better looking than Pastor Victor. But spiritually, you remind me of Pastor Victor. I would be so encouraged because I really look up to that man. And that would mean his influence has imparted onto me. Your disciples, the people you mentor, should, in some ways, receive of your spiritual DNA. So that people can say, oh, you, random person, I bump into in the streets of Boston. Have you been with Doug? Are you Doug's disciple? There's something about you. You remind me of Doug. You throw the frisbee like Doug. You pray like Doug. There's something about you. Spiritually, there should be a rubbing off, an influence that takes place. That's, that's my own. Look at what Paul says. This one kills me. Therefore I urge you, Corinthians, imitate me. What a man that he can say, you want to be like Jesus? Be like me. Oh my gosh. And it's written down in the Bible. I would be so embarrassed if I said something like that and it was printed in our church bulletin. I would be embarrassed. Paul was able to say, imitate me. You want to know what it's like to be like Christ? Do what I do. Be like me. Oh, my goodness. I just want to get on the floor right now. Wow. I wish I could say that. That is such a challenge. Do you live in such a way where... Yeah, you can teach the Bible, you can let's just go over this or that. But in some times, in some cases, you can just say, listen, forget all that. Do what I do. Do what I do. And that's enough. You imitate me. I wish I could. I think I can say that in a few areas, but not in a lot of areas. I think I can, I can say it in prayer. I can tell people in the church, okay, you want to increase your prayer life? Imitate me. I go out the morning prayer every morning. Come with me. Help me, I can say that because I do it. If I were to say to them, you know, if they said to me, oh, Pastor Ulysses, I want to I wanna learn how to fast, I would say, imitate him. <laughs> imitate that guy. Imitate Gandhi. I don't know. Imitate somebody. <laughs> don't imitate me. Why? Because I need to fast more too. But I want to be at a place where I'm such a man of fasting that I could just say, oh, you want to fast? Listen, why don't you? I won't say it like Paul, but why don't you try what I'm trying? This is what I do. This is my schedule. This is how I do it in my life. Why don't you try it with me? Man, that's awesome to be able to say. Oh, you're having a tough time in your prayer life? Why don't you come out in the morning prayer with me every morning? Give it a try. This is what you have to do. You have to go to bed earlier. You have to readjust your schedule. I know you're really tired. But you'll adjust. You'll, you'll get better. To be able to say that naturally and not fake it. That's discipleship. Imitate me. In what areas of your life would you not want people to imitate? Would you feel unsure 
about saying that. Could you say, when it comes to your use of time, imitate me. I'm very good with my use of time. I redeem my time. I am godly with my time. I know my time belongs to the Lord. Could you say, with your money, imitate me. My generosity, my giving, my trust in the Lord and not in finances. What can you say? Can you say, imitate me in those areas in your life? That's challenging. That floors me. Modeling. What's next? Intimacy, accountability, openness, vulnerability. Okay, this is so important when it comes to discipleship and mentoring. This is one of the reasons why I gave you that horror story of why I was such a bad discipler and small group leader at first. Because I had a really tough time with intimacy, with being close, with, with letting people, particularly guys, because I let guys small groups into my life. Um, when I'm with these small groups, one of the things that I have no time with is I didn't like it when these younger guys really looked up to me and they wanted to be close to me. Like, oh, like you're my spiritual father kind of thing. I got kind of grossed out by that. I felt weird. I felt like too intimate and I, I'm trying to like hold them off a little bit. I, I, didn't, I didn't want that. I didn't like it. And that made it really hard for me to, to, to be a small group leader, to disciple other people. And, you know, I, I realized that a lot of this is because of my relationship with my father. Because of the things that I experienced uh, growing up. When I was growing up, I, you know, my father was, you know, he was a faithful dad. He provided for the family. He was a good dad in, in a lot of different ways, right? I'm very thankful. I thank God that my dad was a but at the same time, we really lacked in the communication department. Um, we weren't particularly close emotionally. And I think because of that, I had a difficult time when I was close emotionally with other guys or when they wanted that from me. Like, you're my older brother spiritually. You're my spiritual father. You're my leader. I want to be emotionally close with you. I immediately kind of like backed off. So it felt weird to me. I wasn't used to it. I'll tell you, when we were uh, going to have, before we had our first child, I was really, really hoping that we would have a girl. And then we ended up, we did have a girl. Uh, the reason I really wanted a girl was because I was scared to have a son. Because talk about, you know, discipleship. You're, you are my father. That would be literally, you're my father. Love me. Be close to me. Hug me. You know? Like I watched the... Uh, you know, the, what is that? Yeah, some movie. I I mean, you know, it freaked me out. This whole idea of, of having a son. So when we had a daughter, I was like, woo! Thank the Lord we have a girl. Why? Because pressure's not on me. It's on my wife. <laughs> I can't raise her up to be a woman of God. I can't say, imitate me. Audrey, and you shall become an awesome woman of God. That's your job, Christine, my wife. She has to do it. The pressure wasn't on me in the same way. And I was also closer to my mom, much closer to my mom. So maybe because of that, I didn't have as much of a problem being intimate. And so when Audrey came, you know, hugging her and love her and all these things, then we had Noah, <laughs> boy, second. Uh, before we had him, I would pray to God and I would tell God, you know, I know I need to have a son. I need a son. <laughs> it sounds so selfish, right? Because <laughs> I need to learn how to relate a younger man. I need to grow in that area so I get a son. <laughs> no, I also wanted a son. But you know, over the years, for the past 10 years, God has really challenged me in this area and has really dealt with a lot of junk in my heart and helped me to really embrace younger guys in the side and to be able to be close and to really enjoy it. And now, you know, I'm so, I love my son so much. I love hugging him and kissing him. He's seven months old and he's so cute. And I talked to him, I whispered in the ear, I said, when you get older, we're going to go fishing. We're going to go throw the baseball around. I'm going to tell you about 
tell you all about girls and which ones to stay away from. <laughs> just, just marry the one I tell you, all right? You know? we have, and I, I'm so looking forward to those things now because God's helped me to deal with a lot of those issues in my life. And I'll tell you, if you were like, if you have difficulty being intimate with people, if that's hard for you, if it's tough for you to be vulnerable, if it's tough for you to be open, if you're afraid to open yourself up because you might get hurt, because you got hurt when you were in third grade by what your friends did and they backstabbed you, and ever since then you closed off your heart, and now you have a tough time trusting people, only a couple of people you'll trust after a long time I've spoken out make sure they don't hurt me, I've got to guard my heart, you're going to have a really difficult time. Disciple. Because discipleship requires intimacy and openness. And just like God has been dealing with my junk, if you want to disciple people, you got to deal with your junk if you've got that kind of junk. If you have a tough time being close to people or intimate or vulnerable, you really got to ask God, God, what is wrong in my heart? Why am I like this? What happened? What happened when I was young? What happened recently? What, when did I get hurt? What was my relationship with my parents? Like, is that what caused it? What's going on in me, God? And God will reveal it to you, because God revealed a lot of junk to me in my relationship with my father that I had to work through over years. But by God's grace, I've come a long way in that area. And I really look forward to, uh, throughout my life, growing more and more and being able to disciple young men and help them to grow and become men of God. Still a work in progress, but God has really done a lot in my life in that area. We all need to clear out our junk if we're going to be able to disciple. So ask God, why do I, why am I the way that I am? Why when people get too close do I push them away? Why is it that I have such a difficult time loving people, being open with my heart? You have to think about this. Pray about this. Uh, thirdly, last foundation of discipleship here. You know this, the Great Commission. There's something interesting I want to point out. Now, this is about discipleship, right? The Great Commission. I mean, after all, the word disciples is in there. Okay? Go and make disciples of all nations. I want you to notice what else is in here. Go and baptize them. What does that mean? What that means is as a part of the process of discipleship, of making disciples, involved in that is going and getting your own disciples. Just like Jesus did. He went out and he called people. He said, follow me. They weren't placed in a group. There wasn't a sign up. And then they said, Jesus, here, here's your 12. This is your small group, your discipleship. He went out and he called disciples. And some people didn't follow. Oh, first let me go and bury my father. Some people didn't follow. Jesus had to get his own. In fact, here, baptizing them implies that the full orb, the full spectrum of discipleship, if you really want to be able, want to know how to make a disciple, how, the fullness of it, this is it. you got to know how to share the gospel with someone, how to love someone who is not a Christian and love them into the kingdom of God. See them baptized in the church. And then you teach them everything that you know. That is the process of discipleship. Usually we start at, here is a group of Christians that have been assigned to you. Now there's nothing wrong with that. We all do that. I do that in my college group at Brecken. We have freshmen, you know, freshmen recruiting and all that stuff. And a lot of Christians come in and, and we have to divide them up into family groups and all that stuff. We do the same thing. That's fine. But I want to give you a bigger picture of discipleship. Okay? What are you relying upon when people give you a list of people? This is your small group. That, what kind of leadership is that? That is positional leadership. What do I mean by that? 
those people are in your group, they have to come out to that meeting, they have to quote unquote follow you because you are their small group leader. They have been assigned to you, you have been given the position of small group leader. They, over time, may not want to be in your small group. Over time, they may not open up to you. They may not view you as their spiritual leader. That's very possible because you are their positional leader. But when Jesus went out and called disciples, they had to make a decision. Do I want to follow this guy or not? Is this guy worthy of being followed? Do I respect this guy enough? Do I want to have this guy in my life? And they said yes. Some said no. Some said yes. And they followed him. They went with Jesus. He invited them. We have to know, too, and I would really challenge you guys, apart from your small group, family group, life group, home group, whatever you call it, I want to challenge you. Do you know how to reach out to a non-Christian, share the gospel, lead that person to Christ, and then begin to teach them the first steps of the Bible, how to pray, how to read the Bible, uh, how to, the church community, the importance of those things. Help them work through their issues, clean out their junk, deal with their heart, work on their character, Teach them how to do ministry and then bring them to a point where you can actually say, I can't lead you anymore because I've given you everything I have. You're like me now. Like Barnabas when he was leading Paul, Saul. He said, come with me. And then eventually Paul became the, the, the primary apostle. And I, Barnabas is probably thinking like, I can't help this guy no more. You, you, you can do your own thing. Do you know how to bring somebody, let me put it this way, from zero to hero in the spiritual realm? Do you know how to do that? Pastor Victor did this experiment with a church that he was overseeing once. He said to them, no small group signups. You are going to be small group leaders. But if you're going to be a small group leader, you have to go get your own disciples. Everyone's like, what? And People struggled so much with this. People didn't know what to do. Why? Because for all their life, they've been used to being a positional leader. Oh, I want to be a small group leader. Great! Here's your small group. How much influencing or influence are you having on those people? Maybe a lot. Maybe you're just a positional leader. But a spiritual leader is somebody who people say, I want to follow you. I want to open my life to you. I want to let you speak into my life. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I don't like what I hear. But because I am attracted to you, I want you to lead me. That is, that is spiritual leadership. That's not just positional leadership. I want to challenge you guys, alongside your small groups, alongside whatever structure you have, which is good and necessary in our churches, we're not going to turn people away because they want to be in a small group. I want to challenge you guys. You know, if we took you and we put you in the middle of some foreign country and said, you go, you make disciples, you plant a church, there's not going to be a sign up there. You don't go into the middle of a pagan village and say, I have a sign up sheet here. I'm a Christian small group leader. Please sign up and I will be your disciple. It doesn't work like that. you got to go build relationship, love them, share the gospel, and help them from baby steps until they become a leader. Man, I have to go to China in September. I have two years there. My goal in two years is to raise up a local leader who can take over that church. Just like in the book of Acts. Paul never spent more than two years in any city. And then what happened? Elders. They were ordaining elders, people who are running and leading the church. He did that in two years. I'm not Paul, but that's biblical. And that's what I want to go after. i got to learn how to take somebody from zero to hero. And if you can do that in the side of the ship, you, you're becoming more self-sufficient. You're becoming, you're getting it more. You're, you're becoming Yoda. You're becoming Miyagi, right? You're, you're learning how to do this from the beginning. And you'll see, oh boy, I asked a lot of people they want to be my disciple. They all said, no. Is there something wrong with me? Oh, maybe. How come you don't want to be in my group? Well, I don't really respect you. Uh, when I look at your life, I don't really see Christ. Oh, I guess I better change that. You start seeing things about yourself. I want to challenge you to a higher level 
of discipleship. Go, baptizing them. Three foundations. I'm going to skip over some. I'm going to go quick. Jesus never forced anybody to follow them. Right? It was always voluntary. Um, you know, discipleship is not something you can't force people to be open to you, to open up their heart, their life to you. You can't. It has to be an invited relationship. Uh, discipleship is not a dictatorship. You know, we get upset if people don't listen to us. Don't ever yell at people. One time I yelled at a guy. I remember I was trying to, you know, he's my small group. I was trying to reach him for a month. He wasn't returning my calls. All these things. I got so mad. I yelled at him over the phone. I was like, you say you want me in my small group and all this. And how come you don't come anymore? Turn my calls. I was so mad. And he was really like, oh, sorry, whatever. And I look back and, man, I really wish I never did that. You know, it didn't, didn't go anywhere. It didn't help the situation. If that was where he was, and he didn't want me to speak into his life, he didn't want to come out of the group, what can I do? What can I do? People who didn't want to follow Jesus, they turned away. Jesus is saying, you come back here! Right now! Where do you think you're going? He didn't mean, he let them go. He said to his disciples, you guys don't want to go too, do you? But if they left, yeah, he wouldn't have yelled at them. Discipleship is an invited relationship. I went over this best examples in the Bible. Discipleship can look many different ways. Listen, you know, um, in some churches it may look like a small group. Uh, in some churches it might be like everybody on the worship team. That's like a small group. Because they're focusing on worship and they also, the worship leader might be the disciple. In other churches, they pair people up, and it's like an older brother, older, a younger brother, older sister, younger sister. They're all different structures in doing this, okay? There's no one way. But take advantage of whatever structure your church has. If you like your church, if you love your church, if you want to stay a part of that church, I challenge you, embrace their discipleship structure. You need a mentor, and you need to mentor other people. You need a discipler, and you need to disciple other people. It is the most important thing in Christian life. And if you don't have it, you are doing yourself a major disservice, a major injustice. I will end with this. Um, discipleship, just like I talked about yesterday, ultimately... You can't change people. Only God can change people. You can't change people by teaching them the Bible, by yelling at them, by loving them. God can use those things. But in the end, the only way that people can be changed is through the power of the Spirit. That's why you have to pray for people, you have to fast for people. They can only be changed by the power of God. In Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel saw a vision of the temple. And it says that he saw water running out from underneath the temple. And that water flowed down. And everywhere that that water went, it brought life. And then that water flowed all the way down into the sea. And it brought life to the sea. And before, there were only dead things in that sea. And then it started teeming with life and with fish and with animals and all these things. And that sea, if you look geographically in it, Ezekiel 47, he doesn't say the name, but that sea is the Dead Sea, right? The Dead Sea, which is like so salty, you can float right on top of it. Nothing can live in there. Ezekiel is saying one day, this river will flow from the temple that will be so powerful and so life-giving that it will even turn the Dead Sea, the salt sea, into a fresh body of water that is filled with life. So powerful. And the Jews, they would celebrate this at the Feast of Tabernacles. They would have this ritual where they would remember this promise of God. What they would do is they would take a jar of water and they would pour some of it out. They'd be in the temple, they'd pour some of it out onto the ground as a symbol 
of this water that would one day flow. They would do that on the first day. On the second day, they would pour out some more water. On the third day, they would pour out some more water. Fifth day, sixth day. When they got to the seventh day, yes, I believe it was the seventh day, the jar was empty and no more water. But what the priest would do is he would take this jar and he would pour it anyway. But nothing would come out. But what he was saying through that symbolic act was he's saying, God, we are still waiting for the real water to be poured out. The one that Ezekiel prophesied about. The water, not just physical water, but the water that would flow and bring life wherever it goes from your temple. We're still waiting for that. On this last day of the feast, they would do this symbolic act, saying, God, fulfill it. And then, the amazing thing is, in John chapter 6, at the same day, maybe even the same exact time, it says this, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, and Jesus hardly ever has a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Spirit. What Jesus was saying is, the fulfillment of Ezekiel 47 has come. It is not water that is going to flow out of the temple, but it is the Holy Spirit that is going to flow out of your heart if you come to me and you drink of me. It is the Spirit of God. And anyone who comes to me and drinks of me and has the Spirit of God within them, wherever you go, whoever you touch, Streams of living water, the Spirit of God will come out of you and bring life to those people. Bring life to that neighborhood. Bring life to that campus. The Spirit of God will flow from you. Brothers and sisters, that is Christian ministry. That is discipleship. You need the Spirit of God to flow from you and to touch other people and bring life to them. You can't change people. Only the Spirit of God can change people. So cultivate that Spirit. Grab onto the Spirit of God. Soak yourself in the presence of God so that when you meet with someone, it's not just a physical exercise. It's not just talk. But it is a spiritual influence and impartation that is taking place.